Welcome back to Computer Science 3200. Today, we are talking about an introduction to neural networks. Um, I realize that, you know, modern day artificial intelligence is sort of dominated by the topic of neural networks. And so you may think, oh, well, there's only a couple of lectures here devoted to neural networks. Uh, why is that? Well, it has to do with our particular course structure at the university. So we have an entire course um, which is devoted to nature-inspired computing, and we have an entire course which is devoted to machine learning. And so those courses go into far more detail um, about neural networks than this one, and I don't want there to be too much overlap. So this course is more of an, an intro to a bunch of topics rather than a deep dive into any particular topic. But it wouldn't be an AI course without something about neural networks. So what I decided to do was teach you, like, the deep meaning of how neural networks work, rather than just say, okay, here's TensorFlow, here's how you would use it. So, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's take a look at, uh, at neural networks. So lecture number 18, intro to neural networks. We'll be talking about how they work, but not going into to too much detail. Something that's really fascinating, almost the most fascinating thing to me about neural networks is this fact that in 2010, MIT was reviewing what topics it should drop from its computer science AI course to make room for more modern techniques. And so MIT has a very famous artificial intelligence course in its computer science program. And in 2010, the course had gotten, kind of gotten a little bit stale and they wanted to make, you know, put more modern techniques. And neural networks were on the chopping block they, they ha neural networks hadn't done anything interesting, well, not very interesting, at least, in like 40 years. They were considered, even just a decade ago, 10 years ago, they were thought to be this sort of antiquated thing that sort of had a little bit of, you know, they could be used in a couple of situations, but they hadn't really solved any large problems. But they decided that they were going to keep neural networks in, just because they showed sort of a, an analogy to how, to how the brain might be working. And not because they were like doing anything spectacular, but because they were sort of this historical footnote in, in AI. And in almost 30 years of research prior to this, neural networks had really failed to give any real significant results. And of course, look at how things have changed now where if you look up almost anything about artificial intelligence, you're going to get neural networks. To the point where people nowadays think that artificial intelligence is only neural networks, right? That's how popular and, um, and, and successful they've become just in the last decade. So what changed? Why did neural networks go from almost being dropped from one of the best AI courses in the world to becoming the hot topic in in the world that like your phone now my my phone the pixel 6 has a a neural chip in it that is specifically for doing neural network calculations like tesla cars have neural net chips in them the new i think the new m1 macbooks have something related to neural networks in them how did they become so good well they owe a lot to this man and his research team so Jeffrey Hinton, who is at the University of Toronto, believe it or not, so Canadian um, university, in 2012 released the following paper. It was ImageNet classification with deep convolutional neural networks. So ImageNet is this database of images and it has tens or hundreds of thousands of images. I can't remember which it is and thousands of different categories that those images could belong to. Okay, and I'll show an example of the images on the next page. And one of the sort of, you know, grand problems in computer science was this image classification problem. And nothing had really worked really well up until convolutional or deep convolutional neural networks. So in the next, in one of the following classes that we'll have, we'll talk about what deep neural networks are and we'll talk about what convolutional neural networks are. But Essentially, deep neural networks are just huge neural networks. 
okay? There were 60 million parameters in the network, meaning that, and we'll see in a second what a weight is in a neural network, but there were essentially millions of weights in this neural network. And the purpose of this is, is essentially saying which of these 1,000 categories best, best describes this picture. And it absolutely blew away the competition, right? So it was able to solve lots of instances of problems um, that, were, that were previously unsolved, like, you know, uh, classifying this mite, which is a difficult problem. Um, you know, we have a motor scooter here, container ship. And, and even the ones that it got wrong were almost... Right. <laughs> so for example, look down here at some of the ones that this ImageNet classifier got incorrect, and you'll think it was almost a scam. So down here, the neural net classified this image as a convertible, but the, the actual classifier that a human gave it was grill, like the front part of the convertible, right? So come on, like that, that's actually probably correct. Here, um, the actual classification was mushroom, but the neural net classified it as agaric, which is a type of mushroom, <laughs> right? And here, the image, this is the dumbest example I've ever seen in any classification system ever. There's a literal Dalmatian standing behind a bowl of cherries. The neural net said Dalmatian, but the actual answer was cherry. Like, come on. Like, it it did, it pretty much got them all right. And here, um, it was a Madagascar cat but it said squirrel monkey. And I couldn't tell the difference between the two. So good job for the neural network for guessing squirrel monkey. But anyway, um, this is what Jeffrey Hinton and his team had done. They'd used deep convolutional neural networks and they were essentially the first people to throw tons of computing power at a neural network. And it turns out that that's the case. If you just have a standard neural network and you run it on your dinky little CPU, you're not going to get great results. However, if you have and, and this, you know, convolutional, the, the convolutional part had a lot to do with it, but throwing this at a ton of GPUs that are all doing thousands and thousands of calculations in parallel um, ends up being the secret to, to neural networks really amazing performance as of late. Neural networks were also used um, in AlphaGo and I'll be assigning this movie as required watching for the exam. Um, amazing movie if you haven't seen it. So AlphaGo was DeepMind's um, program that learned to play Go at a um, at a level that beat the world champion at Go, and it's it's way surpassed this now. And deep neural networks were one of the technologies that um, contributed to this. Turned out they used a combination of deep of um, deep neural networks and uh, heuristic search in order to do this. So they combined. Um, those two things. And also um, the poker AI team at the University of Alberta, of Alberta, some of these people in the photo were in um, the lab that I studied at for my, for my PhD. Uh, they also used deep neural networks and heuristic search to beat humans at uh, heads up, no limit Texas Hold'em poker. And so deep, deep learning became a very big thing, right? But if you ask a lot of people, how neural networks work, you get this famous comic, right? Like, okay, I feed in some inputs and then something happens and I get the right outputs, right? So to the point of today's class is to sort of demystify this middle part, right? And say, what is kind of happening in a neural net that lets you get cool results? Okay, but first, neural nets kind of came out of a, a want to understand or at least model the human brain, right? So neural networks are not an exact model of the human brain, obviously, but there are analogs between how neural networks work and how your brain works, okay? Um, so let's just compare computers to brains for a second, just to see what's going on here. So a computer has um, typically one CPU is going to have like a billion transistors, right? So 10 to the nine or hundred hundreds of millions of transistors. The brain has a lot more neurons in it than your typical CPU. So these neurons, um, not only are there a lot of them, but there are a lot of synapses between these neurons, right? So currently as of like today and you know, in the past, the brain 
has more things going on inside it than a typical CPU, okay? Um, storage capacity in a computer, um, you know, you have, I guess, hundreds of gigs of RAM, so 10 to the 12, maybe a terabyte um, of RAM storage capacity in, in a typical computer. That would be like a very good computer these days. In the brain, you've got these 10 to the 11 neurons and 10 to the power of 14 synapses between them. So think hundreds of trillions of these things, right? That's, that's the level that we're looking at in the brain. However, the processing speed of a computer, so how quickly it's able to go through one of these cycles, is much faster than one of these cycles in the brain, right? So we're talking 10 to the minus 8 seconds, so like tens of millions of cycles per second, if not billions of cycles per second, versus the brain, which is doing maybe a couple of thousand per second. And the overall bandwidth of this, um, of what's going on in these two systems, well, computers are still, even though we have like multi-core systems, they're still pretty serialized, right? There's not a lot going on in parallel. And so the bandwidth of these systems may be in the billions or tens of billions of bits per second, whereas in the brain, everything is massively parallelized, okay? So there are like trillions of bits per second of information being passed around a brain. So what should you gain out of all this? I don't know. It's just showing that like there are differences between how modern computers work and how our actual brain works, this sort of 3D CPU that we have going on in our head. This is an example of one of the neurons in your brain. This is a, you know, an abstract schematic of what's going on here. Now, with the caveat that I said before in this class that I am not a biologist, here is essentially what's happening in one of the neurons in your brain. So, you have these dendrites on your neuron, okay, on your neurons, and you get some sort of input signals to those. It turns out that the output signals from the terminal axons in your neuron go into the input signals of other um, neurons, okay? So you get these input signals, which are the outputs from other neurons, and they have some electrical charge, right? The, your brain uses electricity to compute things. So you get input signals into these dendrites, and then what happens is, based on something, the output of these, um, ax the terminal axons fire, okay? So let's look at what happens here. The axons from one neuron terminate or extend to the dendrites of another neuron. So essentially out here, the output signals are going into the input signals of another neuron. Stimulation of the dendritic tree of a neuron may cause the axon to spike like a transition line. So that means based on these input signals, it may cause these axons to spike and give a signal to a new neuron. After firing, the neuron will go quiet for a little while, so it has a little bit of a refractory period. And this firing can affect surrounding and connected neurons, causing a chain reaction. Okay? So, this, if you know anything about neural networks or artificial neurons, it turns out that once I show you the, the diagram of an artificial neuron, it is completely inspired by this, okay? The actual biological neuron in the brain. So while they obviously don't work exactly the same, you know, there's a lot of linear linear algebra going on inside an artificial neuron. What's happening in a biological neuron, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's known yet, I'm not a biologist. But just to show you that it's, it's at least inspired by the actual biology that's going on. Okay. So before I get into, you know, what a neural network is, let's start from the very start. And the very start of neural networks are these things called threshold logic units, or TLUs. So a threshold logic unit has the following, <clears throat> the following components. Here's the threshold logic unit down here, okay? And here's the logic of a threshold logic unit. The threshold logic unit is going to have a number of inputs. And so these are binary. Okay, so you can think of these as like firing or not firing, so true or false. And down here, you can see that um, this diagram of a threshold logic unit has inputs going into it. Okay, these are the X values. Then there are weights going into the threshold logic unit as well. So, the, the, sorry, they're not inputs to the unit. The threshold logic unit has some weights associated with it. 
And what, so for example, down here, if we have input x1, we have a weight w1. Input x2, we have a weight w2, all the way to input xn, we have a weight wn. So the inputs are multiplied by the weights and then they're summed, okay? So we take x1 times w1 plus x2 times w2, and then we go all the way down here to xn times wn, and we sum those all together. So then we get that value, and then the output is going to be a one, so the output's going to spike if the resulting sum is greater than some threshold, and that threshold down there is represented by theta, okay? So we essentially do, if we um, compute x1 times x, or x1 times w1, x2 times w2, xn times wn, that's essentially the dot product, right? It's the sum of the multiplications of all these values. So we take the inputs and we dot them with the weights, and then if that value is greater than some threshold, we get a one out. So this is what this says over here, right? So the output y of a TLU is one if the sum of the weights times the inputs is greater than theta. Otherwise it's zero. That's it. That's what a threshold logic unit is. It's a very, very basic thing. But let's see what a threshold logic unit might be used for. Okay. So we can create threshold logic units for computing the output of various things. Okay. So let's look at some Boolean logic things, if you will. All right. So here we have a conjunction, so and. So if we want to, to create a threshold logic unit to compute the result of x1 and x2, for example, right? So x1 and x2 are binary inputs to this threshold logic unit up here. So um, over here, what we have is essentially, well, what we have right here is our truth table, right? So you remember truth tables from, from your early logic courses, x1, if it's zero and x2, which is zero, the output y is zero, right? Um, if, well, essentially and is only true if both x1 and x2 are true, right? So what you have to do with a threshold logic unit is you have to come up with weights so that when you multiply them by the inputs and you sum them and you have the correct threshold, if the answer is greater than that threshold, it's a one, otherwise it's a zero. So for example here, um, we came up with the weights three for x1 and two for x2. Now there could be an infinite number of solutions to these weights, okay? But if you just look at the output here, if we have three x1 plus two x2, and we have four as a threshold, essentially, so zero or three times zero plus two times zero is zero. And so we'll say, is this output zero greater than four? No, it isn't. So it's zero. Um, now we have three X one plus two X two. Well, this is just gonna be three because X one is zero, is one and X two is zero. Is three greater than four? No, it isn't. Now we just have um, X two equal to one. So the output of this function is two. Two is not greater than four, so it's zero. And Finally, we have one, uh, three x one, which is one plus two x two, which is three plus two, which is five, and that is greater than four, so the output is one. So this threshold logic unit can compute the output of x one and x two. Okay. Now, if we look over here on the right, uh, my face is a little bit, so I'll, I'll move this down. If we look over here on the right, what we have is a graphical representation of what we just did, sort of a graphical truth table, if you will. So on the bottom here, on the horizontal axis, we have the values for x1 being plotted. And on the vertical axis, we have the values for x2 being plotted, okay? So um, the possible values for x1 and x2 are zero or one because they're binary inputs, right? And so if both of them are zero, well, the and of them is zero. So we have this white circle representing zero. If we have both of them equal to one, then we have this black dot up here representing a one. If we have one of them equal to one and the other one equal to zero, then we have them equal to zero, right? So this is a graphical representation of that. However, look at what's happening here. This is the real key to neural networks, believe it or not, is this next sentence. This threshold logic unit 
the formula that we get is the formula for a line in a plane, right? So if we have two, val two values here, then 3x1 plus 2x2 greater than 4 is the equation of a line. And this line over here is that equation, okay? And we've said anything above this line is true and anything below this line is false. So what we've done is we've taken this problem, x1 and x2, we've plotted it on a graph and we've found a line that cuts the trues from the falses, okay? And that's what a threshold logic unit does. It turns out that's also what a neural network does. Let's look at one more example. So this is the threshold logic unit um, down here for uh, x2 implies x1, okay? And so x2 implies x1. It's not, it's like not x1 or x2. The exact same thing. We go through our logic table. I'm not going to compute all of this. And then what we see is we get this graphical representation. So when x is 0 and y is 1, that is the only time that it's false. Otherwise, it's true. And we found 2x1 minus 2x2 greater than negative 1. That is the equation for the line in this plane which separates those values. Okay? Now, you might say, okay, that's great. We can draw lines for two dimensions. What about higher dimensions? Well, it turns out in higher dimensions, what we're doing is we're drawing a plane. Okay? So if we have three of these things, then this equation... Um, with these weights, okay, this is the threshold logic unit for x1 and not x2 or whatever. Um, I'm not going to go through this whole example, but even for multiple dimensions, this ends up working. And so what we're doing here is if we have two inputs, we have a line. If we have three inputs, this is a plane. If we have four inputs, that's like a hypercube or whatever. So you just go up and up and up in dimensionality. And so the key here is linear separability. That is the key term to remember, linear separability. And the definition of that is that we call two points in an n-dimensional space linearly separable if they can be separated by an n minus one dimensional hyperplane. One of these sets may contain points on the hyperplane. So what in the hell does that mean? Well, for, uh, let me go back. Here, we have two dimensions. An n minus one dimensional hyperplane in two dimensions is a line. That's it, right? So in two dimensions, we have a line. In three dimensions, we have a two dimensional hyperplane, which is a plane, okay? So we have a plane, which is cutting off things instead of a line. So that's what that means. And a Boolean function is called linearly separable if the set of points zero and the set of points one are linearly separable. So if we have this Boolean function right here, x1 and x2, we plot their values and we say, are they linearly separable, right? So you draw a plane, or you, sorry, you draw a line, you figure out the equation for that line, here it is, or here is one of the lines. Like for example, we could have another line, which is like this, right? It doesn't have to be that exact line. And if the output of this Boolean formula is if there is a line which separates the trues from the falses, then that is called linearly separable. So, linear separability. Consider the by implication problem or the equality problem, right? In which there is no separation line. So this is x2 equals x1, essentially. So it's one if the output is, or if x1 and x2 are the same, it's zero if they're not the same, right? So here we get this, this is the graph. And you can tell that no matter how I tried to draw a line, okay, well, that line isn't separating anything um, because there's like, there's both answers on both sides. That line doesn't separate them. This one doesn't separate. Like no matter what I try and do here, there's no line that separates that Boolean formula, true and false, all of the outputs. So this problem right here, let me get rid of the uh, annotations. This formula is not linearly separable, okay? It is not linearly separable. And it turns out for many, many Boolean functions, there are vastly more Boolean functions that are not linearly separable than there are linear, li, li, blah, linearly separable.
So for example, in with two inputs, um, there are 16 possible Boolean functions, 14 of which are linearly separable, right? So for example, um, there are only two Boolean formulas of two inputs, which are not linearly separable. This happens to be one of them. But even just moving up to three, right? With three variables, we have 256 possible Boolean functions, but less than half of those are linearly separable. And if we keep going up in dimensions, like with six inputs, there's like, I don't even know what this number is, you know, like trillions of trillions or something like that. And we only have like 100,000 of them that are linearly separable. So for many inputs, a single threshold logic unit cannot linearly separate them, okay? We may need networks of TLUs. What do I mean by a network? Maybe we could create multiple lines. Okay, now I've got a classifier, right? We'll come back to that. that that's sort of foreshadowing. So, one of the first, the, the simplest neuron that we have, once it started becoming called a neuron, right? So, it, threshold logic unit was one thing. Then people were like, oh, let's, let's tie this into biology. So they called it a perceptron, okay? So in a perceptron, you have um, these inputs, you have the weights, looks, looks identical to a TLU so far, right? Then here, we have this dot product, essentially, of the inputs and the weights. So you multiply those and you sum them. Then you go through an activation function. Okay, and so the activation function for a TLU was this threshold here. It said, if you're greater than this amount, the output is one, otherwise the output is zero. You can think of that as an activation function, but an activation function in reality, um, typically there's these, there are these sort of step functions, right? Which means that they're zero until a certain point and then they're true. Right? That's called a step function, where you have one value until an exact point, and then you have another value. So it's one. Um, this activation function for a perceptron just says the output is one if the dot product is greater than zero. Okay, So they just call it zero um, rather than having different values here like a TLU, and it's negative one otherwise. And if we look at this, and then we look at the biological neuron, right? Kind of the same structure. Now I know this is a little bit hand wavy, but it is quite similar, right? So it's in definitely parallels to, to how the brain computes things within a single neuron, of course. So we can think of a very simplified brain model, okay? As a bunch of these neurons that are all tied together. Like your brain literally is a bunch of neurons tied together, okay? So the brain is given some outputs. I'm looking at my screens right now. Something is happening and I get an output, okay? So the simplified brain model might be that our output, and so here we have a bar representing a vector, okay? So if there's a bar, it's a vector. So the output vector is equal to some function of the input vector, the weight vector, and the thresholds that we used in our threshold logic unit, okay? And it turns out that this is what a neural network is, okay? Is that we take a bunch of these simple neurons and we hook them up such that the outputs of one, like here we have some inputs, we have um, neurons that are connected together so that the outputs of one layer of neurons are the inputs to another layer of neurons, okay? So th that's what a neural network is. It's, it's pretty simple in theory, but in practice, the calculations can get complicated, okay? Because there's a lot of stuff going on here. But essentially, a neural network is just a bunch of dot products. That's it. You take dot products of inputs and weights, and you sum them, and eventually you get some output, and that output depends on the structure of your network, okay? However, back with our threshold logic units, we had these weights, right? How did we come up with those weights? Well, for this example, maybe a human went in and it drew a line, right? And it, saw, and it kept drawing lines until we saw 
oh, okay, everything's on one side, everything's on the other side, therefore that's my line. So let me get the equation of that line. So these are the weights of, of those inputs. But how do we get those in a neural network, right? Like how do we actually calculate those? That's all that matters. Like in, in neural networks, all that matters essentially is how you get those weights. Um, all right. So training a neural network, how do you actually train this thing to get those weights that you can actually compute the dot products to get you a, a viable answer? So you're given some input data with some known outputs, right? So neural network training, again, I'm waving a lot of hands here, right? And going over a bunch of, de skipping over a bunch of details. But for the most part, neural networks are trained as a supervised learning problem, okay? So you are given inputs and you are giving, given known outputs, right? You might be given an image of a dog and then this is a dog, an image of a cat, this is a cat, uh, a number seven, this is a seven, right? So running inputs through the network gives us our calculated value. So our ne network is going to start with some initial weights and some initial thresholds, right? And we have these inputs. So we take the inputs, we dot product them, we look at the activation function, we get an output. This is called feed forward because we're feeding these inputs into the network, they go forward into the output. So that's the feed forward, forward step of the network. Training a network involves tuning the weights and thresholds until the values we get out of the network match our training data, right? So what we're going to do is we want to feed inputs in, we see the output that we get, and then somehow based on that output, and its difference or its error from the actual inputs, we're going to come back and we're going to make changes to these weights somehow, such that our, our changes in the weights hopefully get us closer to the real answer. So we minimize our error, okay? So a neural network can be thought of as a function approximator, okay? Because this network, what it's doing is that we have, there's there's some function that exists in the universe, right? Which can classify dogs and cats. We have it, we've learned it somehow, right? So that function out there exists and the neural network training process is the process of approximating that dog cat classifier function. We are trying to train our network so that it gets the weights so that the output is correct. All right. So it's a function approximator. What is that training process then? Okay. So we have some desired function, right? So the desired function, think of this as like the Oracle God function that actually computes the thing that we want. So that desired function, let's call it D. And sorry, D are our desired outputs, right? That is what we actually want to be the output when we run it through the neural network. And that's going to be this G of of x. So x again, this bar means that it's a vector. So we have some inputs, we pass it in, and the desired function gives us our desired outputs. Okay, so this you can think of as d bar as just the true outputs that we want to get from our neural network. Then we have our neural network function, right? And then the neural network is going to give this y bar output, so some vector output, which is a function of the inputs, the weights, and the thresholds. So the performance of our neural network um, is a function of the actual output of the network and the desired output of the network. So for example, how about we take the distance between those two vectors, right? So this is called an error function, right? So we take the outputs that we would like to have seen and we compare them to the outputs that we actually got and then we have some sort of error function between those. So for example, here um, we can take the absolute value of the difference of all the things in both uh, vectors and then square it, right? So vector different, excuse me, vector different, distance. I can't talk today. So vector distance is one possible way of comparing those two things. I'm not saying that this is how all net neural networks work, but the best possible performance would be when p equals zero, 
right? So when we have the exact same thing in the desired output vector versus our computed output vector, that's exactly what we want to happen eventually. And so our goal during training is to minimize the error or to minimize this value of P, okay? That's the goal during a neural net training because if we minimize P, then what we do is we get as close as possible to our labeled training data, which is all we can ever learn on because that's all we were ever given, okay? So if we were given 10,000 images of cats, dogs, and ferrets, and we got those labels, and then we train the neural network, and we eventually get to the point where our answers from the neural network were the exact same as the input, that's all we can ever ask for, right? Is, is to be as good as the training data that we were given. So how do we adjust the weights, <laughs> right? That's, that's the, the magic, that's the secret sauce. So if we have weights W1 and W2, then this is a graph down here of weights W1 on the x-axis and W2 on the y-axis, right? And what this, this is like a performance contour, right? So at any given time, we are at some given weights, right? So what we want to do, let's say that in here in the middle, this is where we minimize P. This is our error value, right? Let's say that we're currently um, right here. So this is the value of our W1 and our W2. So W1 is like 0.2 and uh, W2 is like also like 0.2 or something like that. We, we're going to run our feed forward and we're going to see our error. And if we have this, you know, if we plot all of the values of W1 and W2, we can see our values going toward zero, right? So we want to somehow get to this point where we have, uh, oh, I said P max, but it's at P min that we actually want to go to, okay? So how could we do that? How could we write a function which in which there's some sort of performance contour that we want to get to this point, but we're at this point. We could think of something like search, right? We did a lot of search this term, or maybe we could do hill climbing. It turns out those things are sort of in, intractable. So what the vast majority of neural net um, training does is something called gradient descent, okay? So, and what gradient descent does is, let's look at a, a small, a, a very, um, easy example of gradient descent. Let's, let's use this one over here on the left. So we've got some initial weight here. Okay. So this is like our, our valley of performance. And let's say that this valley of performance, the middle, the bottom here is where we have, um, the least error. So that's where we want our weight to get. And let's say that our initial guess at a weight was over here, right? So what we do is we feed forward with our neural network, we get the error function, and then based on the error, okay, so we get an error here, an error here, and what we do is we say, okay, one was closer than the other, so we draw a line, and then we head in the direction of that line. And hopefully, like, so heading in the direction of that line to minimize the error, that will get us somewhere that's better than where we currently are. Right now, in this case, that happens to be a global minimum. In practice, it may be a local minimum. Okay, so what ends up happening is that you have a point here, right? You draw the tangent to this line, you head in the direction of a tangent, you're now here. Then you draw the tangent to that line, you head in the direction of that tangent, you move here, you draw a tangent to that line, you keep going and you keep going until you reach some value and now you're you're stuck there, okay? Maybe that's good that you're stuck there because it's the best possible thing. Maybe it's bad that you're stuck there because it's not the best possible thing. But essentially, you start somewhere and you keep going through iterations until you converge to some location using this technique called gradient descent, okay? Now I've given a very easy example here, but this can be done in many, many um, dimensions, okay? So any number of dimensions, this can still be done. However, one of the problems that happens with gradient descent, as well as many, many other optimization problems, 
is that these problems are not convex, meaning that there are, there typically, it's there are local minima all over the place. Okay, so for example, what this diagram shows is that if we use gradient descent in this landscape, let's take two points. So we have like P1, where we're starting, right? And P2, where we could have possibly started as well. What this diagram shows is even if we're starting at these sort of like close locations and we follow gradient descent with both of them, one of them may stray off to this local minimum and one of them may stray off to a completely different local minimum, okay? So gradient descent is great because it does follow the error toward a local minimum or, you know, if you're trying to maximize something, a local maximum, but that is not necessarily the global minimum or the global maximum, all right? So gradient descent is not some magic thing that just always solves everything. It goes toward these local minima or maxima. Turns out that it works pretty well in practice, um, but I just wanted to show you that it's, you know, it's not some magic bullet that just literally solves everything. So for gradient descent, what we do is we get the derivative at a specific point in this landscape. Our update function is a function of that derivative. And then we're going to adjust our weight vector based on the partial derivatives of each of the, the, um, the inputs that we have. Okay, and so this I know that I'm not going into the details of gradient descent. This is not a calculus course. We only have two lectures to, to go over neural networks. So this is essentially the process that's going on. But the important thing is, when does this work? It only works when P, which is the error function, is differentiable. Okay, so that's really important. So if we look back at our fundamental unit here, our perceptron, we have a little bit of an, an issue. The function that we're using to calculate the output of our values is a step function. And a step function is not differentiable. Okay, so that's a problem. A step function is not differentiable. So what we want to do is we want to remove this thresholding. Okay, so the thresholding process is not a great process. It's, um, it's like an if statement, first of all. You, you never want if statements. That's really slow. And also, it's stepwise non-differentiable. And in order to use gradient descent, you need a differentiable function. So, threshing, thresholding makes our function non-differentiable and also annoying to compute. So, ideally, what we want is our outputs to be a function of the inputs and the weights and not have any thresholding associated with it, okay? So the first step, we're going to introduce this thing called a bias neuron. So a bias neuron is gonna be an extra neuron that's added to each layer. It's going to have a fixed output value of one, but there are weights on these as well. And what this can do is has an effect, it, it lets us, the weight of a bias neuron lets us get rid of a value that we have to threshold towards, okay? So it's a similar effect to that of thresholding, but it's easier to, to compute because now we no longer have to have like a value of four for the threshold or something, okay? The weight of the bias neuron will help us tune our parameters so that that weight can always be zero, for example. So here, if we, and this, this is the mathematical explanation of what I just said which is that if we had a threshold logic unit that had inputs and weights and a threshold value, right? So down here we have the weights times the inputs greater than or equal to the threshold. Now what we do is we have this bias neuron and if the weight becomes negative that threshold, then this is the function that we have now, which is the same function that we had here. So if we want to do this thresholding process, but we want to get rid of this threshold value, then we can introduce a bias neuron so that the weight will eventually come to this negative theta value. And so now we don't, we only have this zero here anymore. Okay. So we no longer have this threshold value that we have to, to input because the weights of this will eventually tune itself to, to that value. Okay. So that's how we get rid of the, the thresholding value. 
Now, how do we smooth this activation function, right? Because we currently have this step function. And you can see here, if you've taken any calculus, that sharp jumps are non-differentiable, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're going to apply a sigmoid function to smooth out that activation function. So for example, here's a possible sigmoid function. And as sigmoid functions, you can see the stepwise, like it still accomplishes our goal of below a given value, it will be zero. Above a given value, it will be one, right? However, it's now a smooth function. Now in between here, we're gonna get these, um, we do have this like, okay, let me go here. Uh, so above like four, it's gonna be one. Below negative four, it's gonna be zero. But in between, we do have these intermediary values, right? And these intermediary values are going to be the thing that makes this differentiable, which is good. We want this thing to be differentiable, right? And so here are a bunch of different sigmoid functions. So we have like 10 H, arc 10, X over one plus X. Um, these are different activation functions that you can use in your neural network based on different properties that you might want in your neural network, okay? So if you've ever talked about like an activation function, choosing your activation function, this is the part of that that you're doing, okay? So we put all these pieces together and now we have like the new improved modern neuron. And that has inputs, X, weights, W1 through WN, but it also has this bias neuron, which has an always on input of one and it has a weight as well. We take the dot product of these, okay? And we pass that into our activation function, which is a, a basically a smoothing threshold. And here's an example. And then we get the output. And then a neural network is an input layer. We have some hidden layer, which are all of our neurons. And then we have some output layer. So we feed all of these values through with our weights. So the inputs get fed into the first layer of neurons. Those neurons have outputs which get fed into the next layer of neurons and the next layer of neurons until we eventually get to the output layer. So neural network structure now, how do we know how to build our network, right? Like how many neurons do we have? What do we set our initial weights to? Stuff like this. Well, a very common structure is just a fully connected network, meaning that the outputs of one neuron go to all the inputs of future neurons. Um, if we start with a fully connected network, unimportant connections will eventually train to a low weight, right? So this means that there may be certain features in our input data that aren't important. And so if we could have somehow like not had those connections in the network, that would be great. It would save us some computation. But what you will find is that eventually the neural net training will tune those weights really low anyway. And so the neural network sort of take cares of it for us. Neural networks, however, in general, can have an arbitrary structure. They're not forced to be fully connected, okay? And actually, there's some research that is out there that has learned neural net structure via something like genetic algorithms. So we talked about genetic algorithms, right? If we have a neural net with like some inputs, some outputs, and some hidden layers, and we form that, that's the phenotype. We convert that to a genotype and then do um, genetic algorithms. So we use a evolution for that. And like our fitness function is the training error. Then what you can do is you could use a GA to train a neural network if you want. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff. It's, re it's really interesting. So what we get is something like this. As we train, okay, we get, uh, we pass in different inputs and we get different values based on the error of those values. We then do back propagation with gradient descent to update weights backwards through the neural network, okay? And I realized that I sort of, I hand waved over back propagation and the exact mathematics behind that, but there's a good reason for that. And that's because this is not going to be a calculus course where we take like a week to, um, to explain exactly how back propagation works. So there's a great video here called Neural Network Implementation in C++. Um, you don't need to know C++ in order to, um, in order to follow this video, but let me just copy this link and I'll paste that out in the chat.
So this, uh, it's a truly excellent video. Let me make sure that that link still works. Yeah, okay. So this guy goes over that video, It's um, and he, he implements a neural network from scratch with a basic form of gradient descent, and it just works. However, what we're gonna do now is this neural net demo. So everyone out there in the chat should go open this up while you're listening to me talk, because this is an excellent, excellent website. And here it is. So this is the TensorFlow playground where you can play around with training a neural network. Okay. So for example, here, the default thing when I load this has over here some data points. So let's explain what this is. Um, this user interface lets us click play to train a neural network, see its loss over time and see a classifier being formed. Okay, so I think I can, um, can I reset this somehow? Yeah, okay, there we go. So here is the structure of the neural network. You have some inputs, you have some neurons, so we can change, for example, let's go down to just one hidden layer, all right? So we have some number of neurons in the hidden layer. We can change the number of neurons that we have. And then we see the values over here of the classifiers of these different points. So over here in each of these examples, we're given two types of points. So we have blue points and we have orange points. And there's always some pattern to them. But what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and figure out how a neural network might classify these points, right? Because I could just put in a bunch of hidden layers and I could put in a bunch of um, like neurons in each layer and I can just hope and pray that this thing classifies. Oh, look, this is sort of trying to classify right now. Look at it. Oh, here we go. It's classified, right? But let's take the knowledge that we know about neural networks and try and do better than just guess and check, okay? So first of all, let's start with the simplest possible data set, which is right here, which is some points over here and some points over here. Now, what did I say that a neuron was at the beginning? So what did a threshold logic unit do, right? Let me pull up my, my slides here for the threshold logic unit. A threshold logic unit, if we can plot our data sets on a graph, and if those data, data points are linearly separable, then a single threshold logic unit can separate them, right? So what that means, this translates into neural networks, okay? So if I have two sets of data that are linearly separable, what this neuron will do is draw a line through that plane of data, right? So let me learn here, there we go. I've instantly learned to classify this because it has learned with one line how to separate this data. Now I could have two lines in here, right? I could have two lines and it would learn, but essentially what you see here is that the weight of this output is very big and the weight of this output is very small. And essentially what I've learned is the same line, okay? So what you see here is that we only needed one neuron to do this classification because there's a line that separates these data, right? Okay, let's move back to this example. All right, so if I try to use a single neuron to classify these points, what it will do is it will essentially find the weights such that we have the, um, the line, which the single line which tries to separate these things, right? So here, it's found this line and the error is like, it's pretty bad. So like it gets 37% of it right, which is not very good because we can see that one line will not classify this data correctly. So let's use our noggins here. Say out there in the chat, you can see what I have here is some data that's being surround, surrounded by other data, right? So how many lines do I need at a minimum in two dimensional space to surround a data set? How many lines would I need to surround a data set? Okay, a bunch of people already saying three. So let's try that. Let's have three neurons, each of which will hopefully learn their own line 
such that the combination of those lines, right, the weights of these lines are going to be tuned such that we eventually surround that data set. And look, that's what happened. Now we can see the triangular structure that this ends up outputting. It's not a perfect circle, right? If we want to make this circle more and more circular, we add more and more points. It turns out that in this example, a triangle is good enough. So if we keep adding points, the weights of those extra neurons are just gonna be so low that they really don't contribute to anything, right? So we can see here, this, this is such a good tool because it lets us classify or it lets us see the lines that ended up um, that ended up contributing to this, right? So here's the first line, here's the second line, and here's the third line. So anything above this one is blue, anything to the right of this one is green, anything below this one is blue, and then the weights of all of those together combine to form this classifier. So cool. We may have thought, oh look, um, three is the lowest amount of neurons that we need to classify this data set. However, what we haven't done is something that not a lot of people think of. What a lot of people do is they just take their data and they throw it at a neural network and they put a bunch of layers and a bunch of neuro, and just watch this. This is what they do. This is what they do, right? Look at this and they let it run. Okay, now eventually it gets it, but it's a lot more expensive. Look at all the neurons that we have to do. We probably use like three times the electricity on this one than we did the first one. However, do we need to do that, right? No, we saw that we could just use three, um, three neurons for that classifier, but let's try and do better. So over here, what we have are the Um, and what these inputs are saying is that, okay, the data I'm passing in are the X and the Y value. So here we have X1 on the Y value, we have X2, right? But instead of passing in just X1 and X2, let's pass in instead X1 times X2. What will that, what will happen there? Well, let's see. If we have x1 times x2 with a single neuron, let's train. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, so let's ta let's take uh, sorry, x. Yeah, okay, this is the one that I wanted to do. So this values okay x. This is essentially like the distance of a point to the center. Okay, so if we have the x distance to the center and the y distance to the center, then what we end up training, okay, th this is a little bit hard to explain, so let me, let me start over. When we used x1 and x2, we were using this geometry to classify our data, right? So we needed three neurons to cut the planes in that data. If instead we used the distance from the origin as our input data, which is what this represents. Now we only need one neuron. Why? Because if you look at this data, you could make a classifier on the input geometry of just distance from the center. And look, anything that is this distance from the center is blue anything less than that is blue, anything greater than that is orange. So not only can we play with the structure of our neural network, but we could play with the structure of our data as well. And it turns out it's far more efficient to classify these data sets based on their distance from the center than it is to draw a bunch of lines to encapsulate this blue part. So if we just have these distances that we pass in, we immediately classify it almost perfectly because a straight line in the distance space is a circle in the X, Y space. Okay, so if you don't fully understand that, just keep playing around with this essentially. Now, let's look at this data set, okay? So in this data set, if we had just passed in the X, Y values, how many lines would we need to cut out these four quadrants? Well, let's try one line. 
Okay, one line doesn't really work. Let's try two lines. Two lines does surprisingly well in this case because it you can see that like, you know, it only has 16% inaccuracy because it just so happens that a bunch of the blue points fit in these two lines. Uh, let's go to three lines. I don't think a third line helps us that much. Okay, maybe it does just a little bit. But let's go to our fourth line and now we can see... Oh, I think four lines kind of does it. It gets very, very close. I've seen it work even more well than this. Okay, so we can keep adding lines to this to try and make it... There we go. Okay. I think eight is where you start to get like perfect classification with this one. All right, so you keep adding lines and it keeps chopping things up and we have we wait those lines to here. But again, instead of needing eight neurons, how about we multiply X1 by X2 before we pass it in? Because here, this is two positives, this is two negatives, right? So this, if we multiply X1 and X2, then we are separating things into negatives and positives. And so if we're separating it into the space of negatives and positives, then we only need a single line to classify in that space. So if we multiply x1 by x2 before we pass it in, we get a perfect classifier with one neuron. So the whole point of me showing you this is that it's not necessarily the case that you just need bigger neural networks. Okay, you can also change the input space such that linear classification on that space makes your original classification problem um, much easier because you're now like it's not linearly separable in one space, but it is linearly separable in another space. And it's all about linear separability. Okay, now we have another example where there's a spiral. Okay, and so you can have like a that one's not as easy and I can't remember the minimal solution that I found to this one before, but like not everything is necessarily um, that easy to classify. Someone out there said intelligent input representation more important than classification structure. I would say they're equally important. Okay. Because not everything is going to fall into the realm as being as trivially obvious as these examples. Okay, so they're they're both very important, and sometimes um, they are not they're not looked at properly. And up here, what we have is uh, our different activation functions that we could check, um, regularization, which we haven't gone into. Uh, we have a learning rate. Uh, all of these different things go into the backpropagation algorithm that we're not going to touch right now. But that's just it's a really good website for showing how neural networks work. And oh, uh, also. What happens when we add more hidden layers? Well, let's say, let's go back to this original classification problem. If we add a bunch of layers, okay, and a bunch of neurons to, let's say, this problem here, because I want it to train for a little bit, what we're going to see is that the first layer creates lines in the input space, right? So it's kind of linear patterns of the input data. The second layer is being fed these linear patterns of the input data as input to its neural network, okay? So what we see is the second layer is linear patterns based on the first layer, right? And then the third layer would be linear patterns based on that and so on and so forth. So we have patterns of patterns of patterns of patterns. So when you start to get into things like convolutional neural networks, which we'll talk about a bit in its own lecture, um, what you see is the input data may, is like pixels in an image. And then the first layer might be um, uh, edge detection. So it will detect changes between like light pixels and dark pixels, right? Humans are very good at edge detection. So you might see edge detection here. Then in this next layer, you might see linear patterns in edge detection. So maybe you're detecting corners now right? Then you would see patterns in the corners and now maybe you're detecting the side of a nose, right? And then eventually you get to a face, right? And so that's sort of the way that neural networks work is you keep getting more and more and more um, 
complex with the patterns that you're forming, and that's what the different layers do. All right, let's go back real quick to the slides after that cool demo. All right. So neural networks are a method for performing function approximation, right? That could be classification, it could be regression. Given a number of inputs and a desired outputs, try and learn the values for the weights such that the function computes the correct values. That's what neural networks do. So for image classification, right, we might have some input image, which are a bunch of different pixels or gray values. Those pixels would be the inputs to the, um, to the neural network. You may have some hidden layers, then some output neurons. And what those output neurons would be is you'd have one output neuron for each possible digit. Right? So we have an output neuron for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And hopefully, when you pass these through, the 7 classifier is the one that has the highest value. Okay? What else could you do if you wanted to learn? You could learn heuristics. Right? So remember when we had uh, our, our pathfinding example earlier in the class? Let's say we did something like if we took our environment and we computed all pairs shortest distances on the map, and then we trained a neural network where the inputs were the X, Y locations, and the target was the path distance. So maybe we could train a neural network to learn heuristic values, and then we could use that as a better heuristic value for A star. And people have done this, and it works very, very well. AlphaGo combined deep learning, which is just bigger neural networks, with heuristic search, and it used something called Monte Carlo tree search. Unfortunately, I kind of, you know, I don't want to spend the whole um, course on, on search, but Monte Carlo tree search is another really cool search algorithm. And so what they did in AlphaGo was they trained two networks. They trained a value network and a policy network. So what they did was um, they took like tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of human games, okay, and they trained a value network. So they're going to look at a state of the board and the target that they're trying to learn is given this state of the board, who ended up winning the game, right? Was it, was it the black player? Was it the white player? So what they do is they train that network and over time that network gets very, very good. So if you have a value network, think back to your connect four algorithm. Instead of you writing this heuristic function, what if you had just trained a heuristic function? to say who is in the lead at this location. That would be a value network. It also learned a policy network. So based on those same replays of those games that the player, humans had played, not only did it learn who was going to eventually win, but it also learned a network of what moves should I do at this state? So given a bunch of states of the game of Go is input, the output was which of the legal moves did the humans do? And so what this did is, well, just think of if you had to do assignment three, but with Go. In Go, there are hundreds of possible moves, right? So in Connect Four, there were only seven. In Go, there are hundreds. So if you take hundreds times hundreds times hundreds, you can't do search in that space. It's too big. So what they did was they took, they learned a policy network to say, well, of these hundreds of moves, here are the top three moves that we think a human would have done and then it only searches over those three moves. So the policy network helped it do um, this, this um, pruning of the search tree. So DeepMind had thousands and thousands of games to learn from. Uh, the policy network, the input was the state and the target was the move that the human performed. The value network, um, the input was the state and the target was who actually won from that state. But then it got even smarter than humans because it did self-play. Once it had learned all it could from humans, it learned to play against itself. So it continued to learn and get stronger. And when it learns and gets stronger, now it's playing against a stronger opponent. So it gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. Okay. And then also, you know, you throw in some random moves and some bad states so that it learns so that it does this like exploring starts type of type of learning. And what you get out is a very, very good player. So, Go has a large branching factor. I think I already talked about this. I didn't realize I had slides about it. Um, humans have a good abstraction of what moves to do. AlphaGo learned a policy network 
So now it can narrow down the heuristic search to only consider the moves that are output by the policy network. Search also needs a good heuristic function to determine how good a state is, and that was the value network. So the first version of AlphaGo was essentially a heuristic search program, just like your Connect4 program was. However, it had deep neural nets learning a heuristic function, so it didn't have to write one by itself, and it also learned which moves it should do, so it wouldn't have to consider all 300 moves. So that's what the initial version of AlphaGo was. And that is the lecture for today, and hopefully now you know how a neural network worked. works. All right, so that's it for today. Um, remember that if you're in the class and you're a grad student, the project proposal is due tonight. So please get that in. I'm looking forward to seeing them and uh, I will see you in the next lecture.